Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. Hello, this is Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. I'm Neil, and I'm Rob. In this program, we're talking about biscuits. Biscuits, ha, a subject very close to my heart, something important to me and that interests me. I know, Rob. You are a biscuit connoisseur, after all. And in the UK, many of us love to nibble these sweet treats, and we have lots of names for them too. Yes, we have the chocolate digestive, the Garibaldi, the custard cream, and the jammy dodger. Oh, it's making my mouth water. I can see, but we're not going to be tucking into any biscuits today. Instead, we'll be looking at the origins and the language of this humble snack. And before we do that, Rob, let's test your knowledge of biscuits with a question. The British aren't the only fans of biscuits, so in which country are barazeks traditionally eaten? Is it in A. Syria, B. Morocco, or C. Spain? Hmm. Well, I've not eaten one, but I'll have a guess at Syria. Okay, I'll reveal the right answer later on. But now let's talk more about biscuits, also sometimes known as cookies. They come in all shapes, sizes, and varieties. They can be sweet or savoury. But I prefer the sweet ones that are crisp, crunchy, and are good for dunking in my tea. Dunking means dipping into a liquid for a short period of time. But enough about your eating habits, Rob. Let's find out how the biscuit got its name. It's something the BBC Radio Four program Word of Mouth has been exploring. Dr. Laura Wright, a historical linguist from the University of Cambridge, explains its origins. From Latin bis coctum, twice. Cooked, ah. and it comes to us via Anglo-Norman French. But it's bread that's been cooked twice to extract all the moisture, so that it goes hard and it'll stay fit for consumption for a long time. Which is why you can take it to sea and have a sea biscuit. And from the 1500s at least, we spelt it like it sounds: b i s k e t. But at some point in the 1800s, we started to prefer the French spelling for reasons of ponciness.、Mm -hmm. So the English word for biscuits has its origins in Latin. It describes cooking bread twice to make it hard. This baking process meant a biscuit could be kept for a long time, and as Dr. Wright said, it would stay fit for consumption. Another way of saying edible, or able to be eaten. That's why they were taken on long sea voyages, but they weren't like the biscuits we eat now. They were plain, simple, and very hard baked. Interestingly, the word biscuit used to be spelt b i s k e t, but the French spelling b i s c u i t was later adopted. Biscuits are a handy go-to snack for when I'm hungry or bored. But how did biscuits become such a popular foodstuff, and how did we come to depend on them so much? It's something Anastasia Edwards, author of Biscuits and Cookies: A Global History, talked about in the Word of Mouth program. Listen to the word she uses to mean food in her explanation. One key fact in the rise of the popularity of the biscuit is meal times. Before the Industrial Revolution, people have a later breakfast and an earlier supper. By the end of the Industrial Revolution, breakfast is much earlier, the evening meal is much later. So you've got this big gap. Of time、um, where people need sustenance, and so lunch comes to greater prominence, and tea time comes to greater prominence, and snacking. So there's this great opportunity for re really biscuits, something small, something ready, something easily consumable, not expensive. You know, a bit of a sugar rush. Right. So it was the industrial revolution that led to the rise. That's the increase in the popularity of biscuits. Because the time between breakfast and dinner in the evening increased, people got hungry, and they needed food to give them energy. What Anastasia called sustenance. So this is when smaller meals, such as lunch or tea, became important or more well known. It had greater prominence, and this included snacking on biscuits. These were cheap and easily consumable, easy and quick to eat, and because of their ingredients, they gave you a sugar rush, a quick blast of energy. Of course, now we eat biscuits at any time, and because of their sugar content, we know to only eat them in moderation. Rob, <laughs> I think a packet a day is fine, but a whole box—well, that would really take the biscuit. Take the biscuit. Good idiom there, Rob, to mean be the most foolish, annoying, or surprising thing to do. But now let's find out the answer to my quiz question. 
Earlier, I asked which country are Barazeks traditionally eaten in. And I thought Syria. Was I right? Yes, you were. Well done. You are a smart cookie. Barazeks are biscuits filled with roasted sesame seeds and pistachio chips. They sound delicious. I would love to try some. OK, well, we've been discussing the language of biscuits and mentioned some of these words. Dunking describes dipping something, like a biscuit, into liquid for a short period of time. Describing something as being fit for consumption means it's edible, which is another one of our words, and it means it can be eaten. Sustenance is another word for food, and something that has prominence is important or more well-known. And when you get a sugar rush, you get a quick blast of energy from, unsurprisingly, eating something containing lots of sugar. OK, well, we only get six minutes for this programme. That's the way the cookie crumbles, so we're out of time. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. Hello, this is Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. I'm Neil. And I'm Sam. Do you like trying new food? I do indeed. I love eating foods from around the world and I especially like trying out restaurants that serve new kinds of food. Mm, me too. And I like food that is a mix of different styles, sometimes called fusion food. But could I tempt you to some insect tapas or a tarantula donut? Mm, maybe not. The idea of eating food made from bugs and creepy crawlies doesn't appeal. Well, maybe I can convince you in this programme because that's what we're discussing and teaching you some vocabulary along the way. But first, I must serve you a question to answer. It's about food, but not made from bugs. Do you know what type of food is sometimes known as priest chokers? Is it A, cheese, B, pasta or C, potato? I think I know this one, Neil. It's pasta, isn't it? Well, I'll give you the answer at the end of the programme. But let's get back to food made from bugs, which is a growing trend in the Western world. Insects are an alternative source of food, and experts say they're filled with lots of good nutrients, including amino acids and protein. And eating them could help to fight world hunger and reduce pollution. I'm not convinced yet, but I do know that the word for eating insects is entomophagy, and it's something BBC World Service programme The Food Chain discussed. The programme spoke to experts who think cooking with bugs is a great idea. One of them was Andy Holcroft, founding director of Grub Kitchen and Bug Farm Foods. He explained the challenge of getting some people to eat bugs. In the Western culture, is, we have got a bit of an uphill I'd say struggle because preconceptions around eating insects are already sort of ingrained in society. So we already think before we even tried them, they're going to taste disgusting or gross. So to actually get someone to put it in your mouth, the easiest way we find straight away is to try maybe a cricket cookie or a chocolate chip cricket cookie um, where you have, we're using cricket powder. So you don't actually see any insects whatsoever. You're getting the idea that you're eating them so people can deal with that a bit more than actually seeing the whole insects. Interestingly, it seems to be Western cultures that don't like eating insects, perhaps because it's thought to be wrong or just disgusting, even if it's not. As Andy says, people have preconceived ideas about it. To change these ideas is an uphill struggle or needs a lot of effort to achieve. Yes, the negative attitude to eating bugs is ingrained into society, meaning it is a long-lasting attitude that is difficult to change. But Andy and other chefs are trying to change that attitude by subtly introducing insects into food, such as his chocolate chip cricket cookies. This is just for starters. Other interesting and exotic dishes where you do see the bugs you're eating are now being served. I'm still not convinced, but maybe Chef Joseph Yoon can change my mind. He is a chef and an edible insect ambassador. He's also trying to persuade the squeamish, people easily upset by something unpleasant, to overcome their fears of crickets, worms and spiders, and instead see them as a tasty alternative source of protein. Here he is, speaking on the BBC's Food Chain programme, talking about changing people's attitudes. We approach our work with openness, with understanding and inclusivity. When people approach me and they go like, ew, or they react very viscerally, I don't get confrontational. I go like, I understand that you can feel that way. 
And what we need to do is start changing these perceptions from insects as being a pest that bites you or that carries disease to edible insects, something that's sustainably farmed and harvested specifically for human consumption. So Joseph is passionate about edible insects, but his understanding of people who don't like the idea and maybe show this viscerally, having an emotional reaction rather than one based on fact or reason. But Joseph wants to change these negative emotions by explaining the insects are farmed purely for humans to eat and they are farmed sustainably in a way that can last for a long time and is good for the environment. I suppose we kill animals such as cows and sheep to eat, so why not insects or spiders? The debate about this continues, but there's no debate about the answer to today's questions, Sam. Earlier, I asked you if you knew what type of food is sometimes known as priest choker. And I was sure it was pasta. It is pasta. Strozza preti, which means priest chokers in Italian, is an elongated form of cavatelli pasta. Its name is thought to come from the greedy priests who were so enthralled by the pasta that they ate too quickly and choked themselves. No bugs were involved, though. That's good to know, because we have been talking about entomophagy, a word for the practice of eating insects. Other vocabulary we mentioned included fusion, which means a mix of different styles, and the expression an uphill struggle means needs a lot of effort to achieve. Something that is ingrained is a long-lasting attitude that is difficult to change. Viscerally describes having an emotional reaction rather than one based on fact or reason. And doing something sustainably is doing it in a way that can last for a long time and is good for the environment. Well, that's all for this Six Minute English. If you've enjoyed it, join us again soon for more real-life stories and topical vocabulary here at Six Minute English. Goodbye for now. Bye. Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. Hello, this is Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. I'm Rob. And I'm Sam, and I'm having a boiled egg for lunch today. I'll just uh, sprinkle some salt on top there. Oh, you've spilled some salt on the floor, Sam. Quick, throw some over your left shoulder. Throw salt over my shoulder? What are you talking about, Rob? It's bad luck to spill salt. Oh dear, it looks like Rob believes in superstitions. Old beliefs which are based on magic and mystery rather than science. Many superstitions are connected to food, as we'll discover in this programme. Right, like throwing salt over your shoulder to stop bad luck. Oh, come on, Rob. You don't really believe that, do you? <laughs> well, lots of people do believe food superstitions, including otherwise rational, scientific people. For example, have you ever blown out the candles on a birthday cake and made a wish? Or thrown rice over the bride and groom at a wedding? Yes, to both of those. Maybe I'm more superstitious than I thought. <laughs> well, before we find out, it's time for a quiz question about another famous food festival, Halloween. Ah, that's when people carve scary faces into pumpkins to frighten away evil spirits. Yes, right. The tradition of carving pumpkins, or jack-o'-lanterns as they're called in the United States, started out as a Celtic festival in Ireland. But it was the Americans who started using pumpkins. So what vegetable did the Irish originally use to scare away ghosts? Was it A. Turnips, B. Potatoes or C. Squash? I'll say B, potatoes. OK, Sam, we'll find out the right answer later on. What's for sure is that cultures from around the world have been connecting food and magic for thousands of years, and over time it's created some strange beliefs. Here's food historian Tasha Marks describing one unusual superstition to BBC World Service programme, The Food Chain. When you have superstitions and they sort of mix with science and health and medicine and, and one of the examples of that would be something like garlic, which we all know garlic wards off vampires, but uh, it's also been thought to ward off the evil eye. And if you come across the term the evil eye, it's a sort of blanket term that, that sort of applies to any bad luck. Tasha says that garlic is believed to ward off vampires, meaning to repel or stop someone from harming you. According to this superstition, garlic also keeps away the evil eye, bad luck or magical spells with the power to cause bad things to happen. 
Tasha describes the evil eye as a blanket term for any bad luck. Just as a real blanket covers the different parts of your body, a blanket term is a phrase that's used to describe many examples of related things. But food superstitions aren't only about bad luck. They also give our lives meaning. Jonti Rajagopalan owns a tourist agency in Hyderabad, India, where she introduces visitors to some of the city's food traditions. Here she's talking with BBC World Service's The Food Chain about a tradition connected with the Hindu New Year. Can you spot the different tastes she mentions? Some of the traditions give you a little bit of a lesson. Uh, like on every New Year, and not the 1st January, not the Gregorian calendar New Year, but the, the Hindu calendar New Year, we would always uh, be given a... It's a kind of a chutney, which is made of all the five tastes. So you have sour, you have sweet, you have something bitter in it. And your mom would always give it to you, saying that this is what the rest of the year is going to be. You'll have happiness, you'll have challenges, you'll have a little sadness, you'll have bitterness in your life, which I think is a very nice tradition. It prepares you for everything in life. At Hindu New Year, mothers give their children a special chutney a mixture of fruit, spices, sugar and vinegar. Did you spot the chutney's flavour, Sam? There was sour, sweet and bitter. Mothers tell their children that the coming year, like the chutney, will have its own flavours, both good and bad. That's why Jonti says that traditions can teach you a lesson. They show you what you should or shouldn't do in the future as a result of experience. Ah, what a lovely way to end our look at food superstitions. Yes, maybe we should make chutney at Halloween instead of carving pumpkins, or whatever vegetable the Irish originally used. <laughs> yes, in my quiz question, I asked you what vegetable was originally used instead of pumpkins to scare away ghosts. I guessed it was bee potatoes. Which was the wrong answer. <laughs> in fact, turnips were originally used so maybe Irish ghosts are smaller than American ones. OK, let's recap the vocabulary we've learned about superstitions. Old beliefs, which are connected with magic. Garlic is supposed to ward off or keep away dangers like the evil eye, bad luck or harmful magic. The evil eye is an example of a blanket term, a phrase used to describe many examples of related things. One Indian superstition involves chutney, a food mixing many flavours. These traditions can teach you a lesson, show you how to act in the future based on your past experience. Right, well, that's all for this programme. Good luck with your language learning. And if you've enjoyed this topical discussion and want to learn how to use the vocabulary found in headlines, why not try out our News Review podcast? Bye for now. Bye-bye. Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. Hello, this is Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. I'm Neil. And I'm Rob. I see you've been tucking into the biscuits again, Rob. <laughs> well, I have, Neil. You can't beat a bite on a biscuit for a quick and easy sweet treat. They make me feel good, uh, as long as I don't eat too many. So these are your edible comforters. A comforter is something that makes you feel relaxed and feel good. Put another way, it is your comfort food, which is what we're talking about in this programme. Yes, like biscuits, comfort food is snacks and meals we like to stuff our faces with, even if it's not always good for us. We'll be discussing what actually makes us eat the stuff. But how about a question to feast on, Rob? Patrick Bertoletti from the USA holds the Guinness World Record for eating the most cream-filled biscuits in one minute. But do you know how many biscuits he ate? Was it A, 2, B, 7 or C, 15? Well, based on my biscuit-eating skills, I'd say 15. It depends if he had to swallow them as well. I'm not sure about that, but I'll reveal the answer later on. Now, biscuits, ice cream, crisps and pizzas are all good examples of comfort food. They're easy to snack on and they don't require many culinary skills. Culinary means related to cooking. Hmm. Well, that makes sense, but there must be something else that is urging us to seek out this easy food. According to psychologist Shira Gabriel, it's about memories and emotional experiences. 
She spoke on the Food Chain podcast on BBC World Service and said her comfort food was macaroni and cheese, something that brings back memories. At some point in my life, those were foods that were made for me or shared with me by people who cared about me and loved me and took care of me. So because those are the foods that I had in my youth, I've associated them with sort of those feelings of being taken care of. And those associations are strong. The associations we have with food are very strong. And so by eating those foods, I'm able to activate those associations and give myself a rush of positive feelings and a sense of acceptance. So like so many of us, Shira associates eating certain types of food with past experiences from her youth. Associates means makes a connection in your mind with something. And these connections between food and memories are very strong. I know eating biscuits reminds me of eating them after school as a treat. Well, Shira explains how we get a rush, a sudden and strong emotion of positive feelings when these memories are activated by eating comfort food. And it's not just memories that are activated, but also the emotions we feel as well. If we felt happy the first time we ate the food, then hopefully we'll feel happy when we eat it again. It's not always that simple, Rob. Tucking into food that's high in carbohydrates, sugar or salt can make us feel guilty but we don't realise our minds are trying to trigger or start a positive emotion, and it's making us eat that food to do so. The Food Chain podcast explores this in more detail. But what is interesting is that comfort food isn't universal. Some languages don't have a comparable phrase. It's a good point and something food writer Jenny Linford talked about. Here's her theory on why that is. Talking to Italian friends, I realised that, no, they don't have a phrase for comfort food. I think it's sort of irrelevant. My Italian friends I asked about comfort food, they were just, they just said to me, look, you know, food is always comfort and always pleasure and it's a joyful thing. So it's just really interesting that, you know, this idea of comfort food is not universal. It's actually quite nuanced. So according to Jenny's Italian friends, all food brings comfort and pleasure. Talking about specific comforting food is irrelevant. It's not important or has no connection with the discussion. Yes, she thinks the concept of comfort food is quite nuanced, depending on where you are from, so there are small but important differences. Well, maybe we should take comfort from, or feel less bad about, the fact that eating any kind of food can bring us joy, warmth, happiness and comfort. So, if you don't mind, I think I'll munch on another biscuit. Are you trying to beat the record of Patrick Bertoletti from the USA? Earlier I mentioned he holds the Guinness World Record for eating the most cream-filled biscuits in one minute. But how many biscuits did he eat? Was it A, 2, B, 7 or C, 15? I thought he ate 15. Was I right? No, Rob. He scoffed only 7 in one minute. So maybe you can beat him. But before you do, let's recap on some of the vocabulary we've been discussing. Of course, we've been talking about comfort food, food that makes us feel good, and we described it as a comforter, something that makes us feel relaxed and feel good. We also mentioned culinary, connected to cooking. And associated, which means made a connection in our mind with something. Something that is irrelevant, is not important, or has no connection with the discussion taking place. And something that is nuanced, has small but important differences. Finally, when you take comfort in something, you don't feel so bad because of something else. Well, Neil, we're out of time, but let's take comfort in knowing that there are lots more six-minute English programmes to enjoy on our website at bbclearningenglish.com. We also have an app that you can download for free from the app stores. And, of course, we are all over social media. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. Hello and welcome to Six Minute English. I'm Neil. And I'm Rob. And in this programme we're discussing food. Ah, food, glorious food. There's only one thing better than talking about food and that's eating it. Well, I know you are a bit of a gastronome, someone who enjoys and knows a lot about high quality food. But today we're talking about photographing food, not eating it. Ah, that's a shame, because I am on a seafood diet. If I see food, I have to eat it. Get it? 
Yes, Rob, very, very funny. But in the social media addicted world, just seeing food, not eating it, is big business, as I will explain shortly. But shall we feast on a question first, Rob? Yep, if it tastes good. It does. So, do you know the name for the person who's usually second in charge in a restaurant kitchen after the head chef and has lots of responsibility for running it? Is it the A, pastry chef, B, commis chef, or C, sous chef? Ah, well, I'm not a chef expert, but I'll say C, a sous chef. It sounds important. Well, I'll give you the answer later in the programme. Now, let me explain more about food and photos. These days, how well a dish, that's a noun for food prepared for eating, is photographed can matter more than how it actually tastes. And I suppose social media platforms are the best way for sharing food photos on, aren't they? And I have been guilty of taking a picture of my food on my smartphone, but only when eating some amazing food at a posh restaurant. Which isn't very often, <laughs> I suppose. But by sharing images across social media, people see them and think the food looks delicious. I must go to that restaurant and eat it. You could argue it's all about style over substance, meaning the look of something is better than the actual content or product. Maybe, Rob, although I'm sure sometimes the food tastes just as good as it looks. Anyway, the BBC Radio 4 programme, You and Yours, has been looking into this. They spoke to several influential Instagrammers and bloggers. Influential means having the power to make people change what they think. Here's one of them, Rebecca Milford, who edits a website called Bar Chick. What does she think about this new trend? I mean, it sounds very cliche that a picture speaks a thousand words, but I mean, it really does. And I've got friends now that instead of doing what you used to do and going onto the website of a restaurant to see what they were serving, then you'd go onto their Instagram account and check out the images and choose what you want to eat, literally based on what you're seeing. So it has to be presentable, I suppose. Rebecca used a well-known and well-used phrase there, one that is used so much it has become boring, what we call a cliche. The phrase is, a picture speaks a thousand words. Yes, and even if it is a cliché, it's so true. You describe a fantastic meal in a long blog, but you can quickly see how it looks from a picture and then create an idea in your mind of how it tastes. So when you're promoting food, a photo is everything. And that's why some restaurants pay PR companies lots of money to take stylish photos that can be shared on social media. It's like a fashion photo shoot for food. Yes, and Rebecca said the food has to be presentable. That's looking good enough for people to see, because people are making choices on what they see. I've also heard that some chefs and restaurateurs have adjusted their menus to produce meals that look good on a smartphone camera. A restaurateur, by the way, is the name of a person who owns and manages a restaurant. Now, while there is a risk that good-looking food on social media accounts such as Instagram might not match how it tastes, there is a theory your brain might trick you into thinking it does taste good. The You and Yours programme also heard from Professor Charles Spence, an experimental psychologist from Oxford University, about how this happens. We see the food first, or the drink in the glass, and our brain's already imagining what it's going to taste like. And the more beautifully it's presented, the more artistically, that sets better expectations, and they kind of carry over and anchor the tasting experience. Right, so a great photo of food can possibly make us think it tastes better too. We create an idea in our head of how it will taste, which influences our expectations when we actually eat the food. And expectation means the feeling that something good is going to happen. Right, Rob. I'm sure you're expecting the answer to the question I set you earlier. I asked if you knew the name for the person who's usually second in charge in a restaurant kitchen after the head chef and has lots of responsibility for running it. Is it the A, pastry chef, B, commis chef or C, sous chef? What did you say, Rob? Well, I said C, a sous chef. Am I right? You are, Rob. Give that man a job here, maybe in the BBC canteen. Uh, come on, Neil, I think I can do better than that. But before I do, let's remind ourselves of some of the vocabulary we've discussed today. Starting with gastronome, that's someone who enjoys and knows a lot about high-quality food. Someone like me. Yeah, maybe, Rob. We also discussed the word influential, meaning having the power to make people change what they think. We also mentioned cliché, a well-known phrase that is so overused it's become boring. Like, for example, a picture speaks a thousand words. 
You never use cliches, do you, Neil? Absolutely never. Let's move on to presentable. That describes something that looks good, is smart, and is good enough for people to see. A bit like me in my smart new jumper. Do you like it? Yeah, very nice. Well, a presenter has to be presentable, Neil. <laughs> Our next word was expectation, a word that describes the feeling that something good is going to happen. I have an expectation that people will love this program. Well, let's hope so. Yes, and that brings us to the end of this program. Don't forget to check out our social media platforms. See you soon. Bye bye. Goodbye. Six Minute English from BBC Learning English.